Okay, well, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to our um, College of Nursing Study Abroad Information Session. Um, my name is Gwyneth Milbrath, and I'm um, the Associate Director for Global Health Leadership um, and in charge of the faculty-led study abroad programs here from the College of Nursing side. Um, and then um, I'll have my colleagues introduce themselves as well. Um, I'll just go on my screen. Anthony, would you like to go first? Sure thing. Thank you, Gwyneth. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Terenzio. I am the Assistant Director at the Study Abroad Office here at UIC. Um, I am a Study Abroad Advisor for many of our programs throughout Europe and other parts of the world, but I also work with uh, the faculty in the College of Nursing to support the development of their faculty-directed Study Abroad programs, including the ones that you'll be hearing about today. Uh, and I'll be here to give you uh, a little bit of an overview of what we do in our office and some ways that we can support you um, from the study abroad office as well. So thanks for having me. Perfect. Uh, Pamela? Oh, hi, I'm Pamela Meharry, and I'm UIC faculty, that, and I work in Rwanda. So I'll be speaking to you shortly. And Sue. Hi, everyone. My name is Sue Kilroy. I am the director of the Short Simulation Lab at the College of Nursing, and I am going to be speaking to you today about study abroad in Spain. Perfect. Um, Anthony, if you want to kick us off and just talk about uh, this your office and study abroad and kind of the resources you have there. Yeah, sure thing. I actually have a few slides, so let me just pull those up. I can share my screen. Okay. Perfect. Can you guys see my presentation? Awesome. Sorry, my computer is does not like that I'm doing so many things at once. But anyways, here we are. Um, just got a few slides for you guys to go over the um, the you know general application process we have for study abroad. So um, the first step towards studying abroad is to watch our very aptly named first step info session. Uh, this is in the get started section of our website, and it's a, a great way to get an overview of the administrative process of studying abroad. Familiarize yourself with some of the tools on our website, um, and you know that's kind of how you get in our system. So that once you choose a program to apply to. Uh, your your information is already uploaded into our application portal so that you can actually submit an application to that program. Uh, and speaking of submitting an application, the application deadlines um, are the term before the term that your study abroad program takes place. So today we're talking about summer programs. Uh, so for those programs, you would be applying in the spring semester. Uh, so we're actually looking to open up the applications for these summer programs you're going to be hearing about today uh, in the next couple of weeks um, so that you'll be able to <coughs> start working on your applications for them. But then the deadline would be, as I said, in the spring semester around mid-March. Um, so most programs, our general eligibility requirement is that you're in academic and disciplinary good standing, but some programs might have uh, a few specific eligibility requirements, like a requirement to interview with one of our faculty or something of that nature. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's all going to be posted uh, in the information we provide for the program. Um, obviously, choosing a program, myself and your nursing faculty are going to be a good resource for um, helping you narrow down your options based on what's interesting to you. And ultimately, you'll go ahead and apply via the Flames Abroad portal, um, which is our study abroad resource hub that you can access from our website. So if you visit the study abroad office's website, you can click on explore programs in the center of the screen in the header menu. Um, and that's how you access um, the virtual brochures for each of the programs that you might be interested in, which is where the apply now button and the link to it, the application for each program is located. So um, that's kind of where that stuff is located and all that information lives. I know that an important topic related to study abroad is funding. So I just wanted to quickly highlight some of our funding resources and scholarship information as well. Um, we do provide a cost sheet for every single program in our portfolio uh, that breaks down the cost of the program in terms of not only tuition and fees, but also um, personal expenses, things like airfare, if it's not included in the program cost, although in many cases um, for faculty-directed programs, airfare is included. Um, 
but you can actually use that to for budgeting purposes and to work with the financial aid office to see if it's possible to use your financial aid package uh, during the term that you're studying abroad. Uh, we also have a pretty wide array of scholarship opportunities that are available to, to study abroad students. We have many scholarships within UIC SNAP, our scholarship database here at the university that you can search for and apply to for specific study abroad study abroad uh, scholarship opportunities that are specific to study abroad. Um, many of these are open to all students, but we also have specific scholarships that are um, geared towards specific types of programs, many of which actually uh, give preference to students who are studying abroad on faculty directed programs. So if you end up moving forward with an application to one of our nursing faculties programs, uh, there are some scholarship opportunities specifically for you. Let me just quickly show you if I can click this link actually where this information is on our website. Um, again, if you're here in the funding resources section, which you can get to from the homepage, click on scholarships, and you can expand each of these menus uh, to see more information about specific scholarship opportunities that we have. Um, let's go ahead and present again. Uh, a couple of scholarship opportunities to highlight. We have uh, the Gilman International Scholarship is a nationally competitive scholarship that we recommend students consider. Uh, it's quite a generous scholarship. It's for it's open to students who are recipients of the Pell Grant. Uh, and even though it's a national scholarship that students from all across the US, United States apply to, uh, UIC students have a great track record of receiving this scholarship so that we, we always recommend that you consider it. Um, awards are up to $5,000. Um, there's also a number of um, external scholarships that are related to the type the location that you're going to non traditional destinations which, um, for example, uh, the program in St. Kitts and Nevis might fall into that category there are scholarships to support that. Um, and we also have <clears throat> a number of scholarships again through the, the study abroad office that you can apply to in UIC SNAP. Um, one other scholarship opportunity to highlight is the first generation Flames Abroad scholarship. If any of you on the call are first generation college students, the first person to go abroad in your, uh, excuse me, to um, go to college in your family, there's an opportunity for you to apply to a scholarship to use on a faculty directed or exchange program. Um, that you would apply to in your first year and then use that uh, study abroad experience later in your college uh, career. And it's not going to the next slide, but we'll see what we can do. All right, yep, so there's some information about the first generation uh, Flames Abroad scholarships. There are 10 awards with this scholarship program that range from between $1,600 to $2,600. And uh, as I said, these are uh, applicable to UIC faculty director exchange programs. So if any of you are first year students and the uh, first generation college student, highly recommend you consider this scholarship and you can apply to it uh, next semester when it opens in the spring. And we just have a couple of testimonials from study abroad alumni. The overarching theme here is that everyone who you'll speak to who has studied abroad will tell you the same thing, that it was a life-changing experience, that they're so thankful that they did. So uh, we highly encourage you to get in touch with us, get in touch with your College of Nursing faculty to talk about study abroad opportunities and how you can make this a reality for you and how we can help. And just want to put our contact information on the screen as well. You can visit our website, make appointments with us, and I advise, uh, or just reach out by email or phone or visit us in University Hall uh, on the fifth floor. We are here to support you, so get in touch. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Oops. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we'll go ahead and have each of our three um, program directors talk a little bit about each of the programs. We'll start with um, Dr. Meharry, and she's going to talk to you about the program in Rwanda. While she's getting set up, um, were there any questions about the application or scholarship process for Anthony? Um, I saw the question in the slides about our, the chat about access to the slides. Um, I will check with everybody and if they're all comfortable sending me and sharing the slides. Um, we'll have a link to where, to the slides uh, posted where we post a recording, which will be on the um, UIC Global Health Leadership Office um, website for nursing. Right. Is this um, uh, Gwyneth? Can you see the full screen? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, this is uh, Pamela Meharry, and uh, the course in Rwanda is Global Maternal and Child Health. 
And you can see this is a map of the African continent. And you can see in, in around the middle is a little airplane there. <laughs> uh, and that was me coming back from the US in uh, May. Um, so uh, you can see that it's just, it's actually Rwanda is right near the equator. So I'm uh, Pamela Meharry and I have, I'm a certified nurse midwife. So I was trained in the US. And um, I worked in the US for many years until I came here to Rwanda uh, through the Human Resources for Health program in August 2015. I've been here most of the time working for UIC apart from one year in Zimbabwe. And I have enjoyed my time here so much. I've done so many exciting things um, at school uh, that I wanted this opportunity to be available to you as well. So this uh, course is Nurse 498. It's a special topic. It's uh, six credits, and it fits into the requirements of a major, or minor, elect elective general studies. And this year we had our first cohort come through in July, and we had two undergraduate students, three master's students, about to graduate, and we had two DNP students. Uh, eligibility is a GPA of 2.75, um, completed at least 12 UIC credits. Um, you could be in a major of nursing, midwifery, public health, allied health, or maybe some other area. And as I mentioned, undergraduate or graduate students. Uh, the highlights of the academic and uh, practice assignments include we have class two mornings a week. And the class is at the University of Rwanda. It's just a 10 minute walk from your apartment. Uh, we do observations one day a week in the referral hospital. Um, and we look, of course, we're focusing on maternal newborn care. So you can go into any of those different areas within the hospital setting. We also have two days in the skills lab. Uh, we use the World Health Organization MCH uh, recommendations, which is for neonatal resuscitation, helping babies breathe, and um, helping mothers survive postpartum hemorrhage. And that photo on the right shows us in the skills lab with one of the students learning how to do manage postpartum hemorrhage. We also have high fidelity equipment there as well. Um, in one particular model that actually gives birth to a baby and placenta. So that's also an option if you're interested in doing that. Uh, so one of the academic requirements is a course project. And so uh, we want you to make a connection with local people and find out exactly what they would like to learn about. And we we're most fortunate this year where we went to the Women's Center uh, for one particular event and several of the students decided to go back for basket weaving on their day off and they learned about a topic for their project which was really well done and uh, so the women there there's about 50, 50 of them at the women's center they wanted to learn about uh, breast cancer and cervical cancer I think some of them had been in for care and had not and did not get response back from from the facility or something. So they wanted to know more about education prevention and management, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's the two photos there. Uh, they're actually conducting the, uh, that's a cervical, um, cervical cancer one. And then the breast cancer also went um, afterwards. And that's the, good, um, the students there in the middle. They're so happy afterwards because they had a really good reception uh, it was actually in the um, the Women's Centre and they were at their sewing machine. So you can see that photo on the left. Um, we did it at sort of short notice to, at that particular time and that was the only room available. So they were there looking at their sewing machines while listening about education. And to the right, we have um, Angelique in uh, action here. She's a lactate, certified lactation consultant and she wowed the midwives and nurses at the tertiary hospital with its slides on breastfeeding. And I think they could have listened to her for two weeks. Um, they were so um, really absorbing all the information and asking good questions. Uh, so our first trip was to Lake Kibu. Uh, this year we only went for the weekend, but based on the feedback from the students, they said you should make it three days. So that's what we've done for this next year. And on the way to Lake Kivu, we stopped off at a health post, which is the, when you think of a health system, the health post is the smallest clinic that there is available in Rwanda. 
whereas you do your clinical uh, observation in the tertiary setting. So uh, here's the smallest one. We were very interested to see what they do. Um, so uh, here's Dietrich at a um, microscope, and you can see on the wall there that there's some different um, photos of things that you might like likely to see under the microscope. And we saw the medications that they distribute there and other teachings that they do. In order to get to Lake Kivu, the best way to get there is actually by a boat. Uh, the last, otherwise you get um, can go by bus, but it's the 10 month, last 10 kilometers are actually really rough. So we decided to go by boat. It's an hour and a half uh, and a really nice trip. We had two boats. And uh, that photo on the left, uh, down the bottom, is actually um, the lodge where we stayed at. It was really lovely. And um, that photo in the middle, one of my favorite photos, where we went to the coffee washing. So they have a lot of coffee plantations in the area. And um, the drivers bring in the coffee beans to be, um, to be washed and processed, packaged there. And so, um, there's um, Mariah, she's, she's grounding some coffee and um, there's Polina tasting it, I think it's classic. Okay, and on the right, we were hiking on the Nile Trail. We had a lot of really fun um, events happen along the way, particularly with the local children wanting to say hi. And um, they got a few hugs, I think, along the way as well. And some of the cultural highlights of coming to Aranda, uh, the genocide, uh, which happened in 1994, um, is, is a big event here and um, some of you might have seen the Hotel Rwanda movie or read some books on it. Um, so we went to the Genocide Memorial, um, there's a museum, there's also the reconciliation camp and uh, also there's a church um, that was, that was um, also centered on this as well. At the top, um, so we went that, to that um, one day and that evening we went to Hotel Rwanda, it's now called Mill Colleen Hotel, and we watched the traditional dances and wow, if you like drums, you'll love this. Um, it was really exciting. And that photo down in the middle is Umaganda. It's a community event here, the last Saturday morning of the month. People get out into their community. It's a national initiative actually that's been going on for many years. And what we decided to do was to help clear a plot of land uh, for a vulnerable family. They're going to build a house. And you might be able to see the lady in the front there with the little child. Well, that's the vulnerable family that we were clearing the section for. And we had a lot of fun. It got a little hot there, but we all got, this is afterwards, we're all a bit grubby, but we had a good time. And on the right is the uh, Women's Centre event where um, the students came in to, uh, they with, with the women, they bought food, they prepared food, and then they learned how to um, enjoy Rundin food, um, Rundin style. Our second trip, our weekend trip, was to Akagera National Park. And um, on the right, you can see we were welcomed with some nice fresh watermelon juice. That's a very big thing here to be given fresh juice when you arrive at events. And on the top right, we're in a safari vehicle. That was a lot of fun as you can imagine. And uh, the lower right, we were in, there's a nice lodge there that we stayed at. They had a swim pool, so please bring your swim suit. Um, they also have a lot of pools in Kigali as well. And um, we had a really nice time there. So the big event of that weekend was this elephant. Uh, apparently it was a young uh, male elephant traveling alone and he was on this road and there were vehicles behind him and vehicles in front and he wasn't but he didn't get off the road he stayed on there uh, was coming towards us and um, anyway it, we had some we were entertained for about 20 or 25 minutes there it was great and we got some really nice photos uh, so um, our last event major event out of town was at Swathe tea plantation and uh to lead up to that, we went to UNICEF uh, headquarters in Kigali before we left town. And we heard about the food program that they have. There's a big problem in, um, in Africa on malnutrition and stunting as well. So you look at a child that you think six and they're probably four. Um, so they're trying to um, subsidize food and, and also um, you, uh, in, in add extra information in, um, to classes. And so we went along to here and they, they speak beautiful English. They did their alphabet, body parts and 
all sorts of things. We took coloring um, books and actually Mariah took some soccer balls and we got outside and they had a blast uh, kicking around these soccer balls. And um, that last week, uh, Dr. Rohan uh, Jeremiah was with us. So that was kind of special. He came to Sawathe Tea Plantation with us, also to the UNICEF meeting. And there we are walking along the street, there road, uh, the seven and then um, Rohan's with us. And of course, that's the tea plantation, tea, um, plantation on the left there. Okay, so, um, so we're mostly located in uh, Kigali, which is the capital city. It's very safe, very clean. Uh, it's very easy to get around. There are so many places within 10 minutes of your apartment. Uh, you'll be here in July, so it's the dry season. Uh, temperatures are in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it's a low resource country. Um, you're in the global north and we're called the global south here. Uh, and there are Rwanda's aiming to be a middle income country by 2035. And so they've got a lot of initiatives to do better, uh, particularly in health and education. And there's many exciting opportunities for you here. Um, the housing in Kigali, we're probably going to be at Alto's Apartments again. It's in the city center. Uh, each student will have uh, will will be in one apartment. And so you have your own bedroom and your own toilet and own desk and chair. Uh, but you will share the bathroom, living and dining, kitchen and the balcony area. They have high speed internet and that was really valuable for the students this year because three of them were uh, in the master's program. They had two other courses to do over summer. And also the DMP students had other obligations as well. And uh, there was everybody was able to access their family um, at any time with that internet. And probably one of the highlights of the trip for many of the students was the weekly laundry service that also included ironing. Um, so be on the lookout for that if you decide to come. And I mentioned it's safe um, within 10 minutes of most facilities uh, in the area. And that first photo is Alto's apartments. You can see it's in the back there and it's eight stories high. And so that's, that's where they're located. It does have um, um, an elevator there if you need, no, a lift if you need it. And so um, let's see, the top right photo is Akagera Lodge. We'll be staying there again for the weekend and Rochelle Lodge is at Lake Kivu. Um, that'll be for two nights this year, this next one. Um, so the program cost is $5,478. It includes uh, six UIC credits, that shared apartment in Kigali. Um, if you did want your own room, you, there, you would be able to get your own room, but there is you have to pay several hundred dollars more. Uh, but they are shared um, hotel rooms on the two weekend trips away. Uh, the program fee also covers airport transport in Rwanda, local transportation, for any of those program excursions, the meals covered on the trips out of town and international health insurance. Does not cover flights, uh, passport, visa. Currently it's $50 at the airport. Uh, individual meals, personal expenses and additional fees, a $50 application and the 200 um, SAO fee. Um, Anthony mentioned about the funding for it, uh, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, we'll be sharing those links with you. I saw that in the chat session about that. And the Gilman International Scholarship um, would be quite favorable for uh, students coming to Rwanda. There's also the Fund for Education Scholarship that opens November the 16th and the deadline is January the 18th. And here's a little bit more about the Gilmore International Scholarship. Um, Anthony mentioned this one awards up to 5,000. Um, 8,000 if you're studying a critical need language. I looked it up and Swahili is on there. That's actually one of the main languages now in Rwanda. So we have Kinaranda, which is the local language. Uh, French, most people speak French here because of the um, Belgian influence uh, and French influence. And also, um, English that they started here in 2009. So now the fourth um, language is uh, Swahili. So maybe you're interested in that. Um, application fees for this open mid-January and the deadline's March the 9th. 
Uh, so next steps, um, apply for a passport if you don't have one. Uh, speak to your academic advisor. If you run into any uh, problems with your academic advisor, because perhaps they don't know that you can do um, more than this course over summer, um, I know that Gwyneth knows everything about this um, <laughs> in relation to uh, finding a way to, to include a study abroad program over the summer, and Tina as well, I think. Um, also, um, oh, Anthony mentioned about the Flames Abroad portal, and let's see. Um, also, for this program, you need to have an interview with me, and it can be via Zoom or WhatsApp. In fact, um, yeah, it's it's very easy to do. I'm available. Now, there is a time difference. I'm in Rwanda right now. It's a seven-hour difference. I'm seven hours ahead of you. Um, so we have to bear that in mind when we arrange an interview. Okay. And then any questions or comments? Um, I'm very happy to answer anything. And uh, also, if you are interested in coming to Rwanda, uh, I suggest that we could start a WhatsApp group and um, and go from there. Any questions? You can see I'm very motivated and excited about my program here. I think it's great. You'll love it. And Pamela's program is on a very good track to be opened up in about a week or so. So we should be able to uh, start accepting applications for this one very soon, as well as for the other faculty director programs we've got coming. But if you are interested in this program, feel free to reach out um, and maybe get started on the first step uh, info session that's on our website so that you can get ready to apply very soon. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Meharry. And um, we will, uh, if there's any questions, you can put them in the chat or we should have some time at the end um, if you think of questions then. So um, I'll go ahead and have Dr. Sue Kilroy share her screen and talk about um, her program in Spain. Okay. I can't see. Well, I'm just gonna do it. Oh, I'm just gonna do it like this. Can everybody see that? Okay, so yeah, my name's Dr. Sue Kilroy and I'm from the College of Nursing and I'm here to talk to you today about culture and health in Spain. Um, the dates are May 7th to May 27th, 2023. The location, uh, we're gonna go to three cities, Pamplona, Seville, and Barcelona. Uh, the course is NUAL 498. It's called Culture and Health in Spain, and it's a special topics course, and it's six credits. And the faculty director, I believe this year, is going to be Dr. Milbreth, who's going to be already in Spain, so that's great. Um, and the program fee, right now, the fee is at $5,800. we are still working on some final touches. We're trying everything to get it a little lower. But um, as uh, Dr. Pamela said that, you know, it doesn't include your airfare, um, you're spending money, but it does include some meals and uh, everything else in the course. Um, the eligibility is for undergraduate or graduate students in the health science colleges. Um, the students must be in good academic standing and receive permission from your faculty, and we're setting the GPA at 3.0. Um, so way the program set it up, set up is uh, we're partnered with the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain, which you can see is this little orange dot up here. Um, and the way it's set up the first week is uh, they call it nursing summer school. So any nurses that come will go into the nursing summer school. And last year, we only brought two students from, uh, from UIC, but there were about 12 students from the University of Penn and about 12 from Navarra. So it was a lot of fun um, to meet people from all over the world. Um, but the nurses will go to the nursing summer school, and then we're gonna have a separate part for the other professions, and we're gonna do interprofessional education. So um, the mornings will be classes, and you'll have speakers on quality improvement or um, trauma response or um, patient-centered care. But the underlying theme throughout the whole course is comparing the US healthcare system to that in Spain. So what's similar and what's different based on different topics. So in the morning, you go to class, probably from like 9 to 12, then you have a longer lunch, and then in the afternoon, um, we go on excursions. So that's how all three weeks are set up. Mornings, academic, lunch, and then um, cultural events in the afternoon. And there will be free time. You will have some free time so you can do things on your own. 
Um, so I explained the first week. This um, when we go to Seville, um, instead of being in class in the morning, we're going to have some interprofessional clinic experiences. We're going to observe in um, clinics in Seville. That's going to be our class in the morning, and then cultural. And then when we get to Barcelona, we're going to do some community health volunteer experiences. So that's going to be our. We're going to have a global classroom the last two weeks. So we'll actually be in the community observing things, um, and then afternoons for. Um, cultural things. We'll also have daily and week weekly debriefing sessions. And like I said, cultural activities are threaded throughout all three weeks. So this is the University of Navarra. It's a beautiful campus. We were really lucky we got to go there last year twice. Um, this is the dean of the nursing school. This is the entrance to the nursing school, some of the classroom. It, it's just really beautiful um, place to visit. Um, here's the clinical simulations. You will get to go into the sim lab for a day. So that's a lot of fun. They have a lot of similar equipment as we do in the College of Nursing. Um, here's the hospital. Um, I heard Pamela talk about iron ironing. Uh, just so you know, the nurses there get their uniforms washed and ironed. Um, I was like, almost want to move to Spain just for that. So there's Gwyneth showing them the beautiful uniforms. And there's a couple of managers we met with, but it's it's a great, um, and they have a public hospital and a private hospital, and I believe we get to tour both. So that's another one we can, you know, talk about the differences and similarities. And then here are just some cultural activities. And like I said, they're going to be over the whole three weeks, but some of the ones in Barcelona are an Tony Gatti tour, Sagrada Familia, um, in uh, Cafe Urena, um, and, and running of the bulls are in um, Pamploma. So you can see us up there. That's the tour, the running of the bulls. This is Cafe Urena. That's Ernest Hemingway um, hot spot. He's very famous there in Pamploma. Um, so it's it's just beautiful. The country is beautiful. So they're just some of the highlights. Um, my personal favorite was San Sebastian. We went there one, we spent a long afternoon there. It's a beautiful little beach town. Um, lots of shopping, lots of, you can go hiking up a mountain. It's it's one of my favorite places in the world now. Um, some other places we're going to visit is Seville. And actually, I haven't been to Seville. So we are partner partnering with a company in Spain, and they are actually located in Seville. So they are really going to help us and take care of that. But they have activities lined up. So there are just some pictures um, from Seville. And that's that's way in the south. So Pamplona is in the north, and Seville's way in the south of Spain. And then there's Barcelona, another one of my favorites. Um, there we are on the train. The train system's really nice in Spain. So once we get there, we'll probably use the train system, the beach in Barcelona. Um, shopping is amazing. Um, so yeah, it's just a great, great, you'll never get bored. I'll just, I'll tell you that much. And then for housing, um, it's similar. We have uh, apartment housing, but you will share a room. You can see up here, there's um, a room with two beds. Um, but you will share a room and bathrooms with your roommate, but in the house, there'll be a shared living room and a shared kitchen. So that's one format of housing. Since we're going to be in three different cities, it might change. Um, the other format is like dorm style, where you once again will have a roommate, but you'll have your own bath, private bathroom. Um, but we'll all be in the same building. So what, we won't be far apart or separated. And the one thing that's nice about the dorm style, there are students from all over the globe that are there. Um, and so in the morning, a lot of them have like um, community kitchens. They have community refrigerators where you can label your food and, and put it in there. So we, you know, we saw a lot of the students waking up and having breakfast together. Um, you know, you can cook meals together. So it's just a, you know, you get to meet so many people. Um, so it's also very fun. But these, this is an example of Pamploma uh, housing. And then just real quick, your learning outcomes, I kind of touched on this. We want to experience the local Spanish culture, describe the Spanish healthcare system and how it's implemented at the local and national level, learn basic conversational Spanish and Spanish medical technology. I didn't really dwell on this. We're going to thread this through because one of, you know, we're at UIC on the west side of Chicago. There, It's a, a lot of Spanish speaking patients. So we really want to maybe just give you that foundation, how to walk in the room, orient the patient to the room, introduce yourself. So we're also gonna um, work on that. Um, we're gonna analyze current global issues in healthcare and nursing, compare the role and responsibility of healthcare professionals in Spain versus healthcare professionals in the United States. And I'll, I'll give you one example. We did a virtual SIM day and we did an interprofessional SIM at UIC and they just thought that was so interesting because they don't do SIMs that way. Like we had a respiratory therapist come and we had 
the charge nurse come and the doctor come. So just, just thinking about the differences um, in the way they educate and the way they do their healthcare system. And then lastly, apply the inter interprofessional education collaborative competencies. So as many of you know, when whether you're becoming a pharmacist or a nurse or a doctor, you, you never graduate and just work in isolation, right? You're always um, communicating with everybody and you're always relying on your peers and other coworkers. So that's another big thread throughout the whole um, course, how, how we can be uh, improve our interprofessional connections. And then evaluation. So it's it's going to be a fun course. Participation. You just have to show up, right? Reflective writing and assignments, because we really want you to reflect and think about what you're learning every day. Clinical observation journaling. That'll be 30%. Lunch debriefings. We're going to have working lunches in some of the cities. So um, it'll be like we'll debrief our day, especially when we're in the community. Those two weeks, uh, we thought having, you know, working lunches, everybody could share their experiences. And then last but not least, we want you to do a digital storytelling where you do, you know, a TikTok or a short video on uh, maybe your favorite place. So make sure you, you know, take a sample of your adventures and then you can pick your final one and then present it at the end. Everybody gets to present their favorite place and tell us why. Short, we're talking short and fun. Um, so that's it. That's it. If anybody has questions for me. Hi, uh, I'm currently an FNP student, and I was wondering if this program is available to us as well. Yes, right, Gwyneth. Yeah, the FNP students can go, graduate and undergraduate. University of Penn, I think they had two graduate students, and they also had a student that had just graduated, but she wanted to go to Spain before she she finished her classes, went to Spain, and she was rushing home to go to graduation to walk across the stage. So yes, you you are welcome. Do you know if FNPs are able to practice in Spain? Because I was looking it up and I don't think they are. So they they don't. What they do, uh, so they'll graduate as nurses. And then when they're in the clinical setting, they take um, advanced within the hospital. And then they become, a, uh, I don't know what they call them. Do you remember, Gwyneth? But they're an advanced nurse. But mm -hmm. they don't have an MP program like we do. That's Thank one you. of the differences, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, they kind of more have a CNS role, I believe, but it's yeah. not like translatable between institutions. Yeah. Um, and I think they can do some prescribing as well. If yeah, so the, and they so specialize. That's something that you'll learn about for sure. Yeah, and so they specialize. So they'll um, specialize in pediatrics and then you kind of become an advanced nurse because they were calling that. We went on a tour and they kept talking about their advanced practice nurse and we're like, oh, you have it. But it's, you know, when we started having the conversation, it's different. Um, but they're, they're nurses that are very experienced, have been working 10 plus years, um, and then they pick a specialty. Yeah. Um, I had a question about if any of these programs would like you'd also be able to do them um, like the summer after your senior year um, of graduating from your, with your BSN, like how that would work. Gwyneth knows that answer, but it's a yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to like phone a friend also with Anthony here, but you can apply as like a non-degree seeking student because technically you would have graduated, but mm -hmm. you can still go on the program. So for example, um, for my program in St. Kitts and Nevis, I had a public health student who just graduated who still came on the program. Um, so he just had to do an extra step um, to do this, like get a non-degree seeking student status, but then you're eligible to apply and able to attend. Does that sound correct, Anthony? Yep. All correct. I'd say if that's you, just reach out to us and we can help you through the process, but that's that's totally correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. And then I, I know you guys said that the airfare isn't included in that price, but will the housing and rooming be included? Yes, yes. The housing, um, all the activities are included, you know, the cultural activities, all the coursework you know, your six credits, um, you will have to have spending money because not all the meals are included. We're, we're kind of doing a combination where some meals are included, some aren't. And, and that's the beauty of living in the dorm situation because you could just go grocery shop and then, you know, save some money that way. Um, but yeah, not what airfare about, and not all your meals. Yeah. What about the transportation between the different cities that we visit? Yes, that's included. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you are an FNP student and if you have classes and clinicals in the summer, how would that work with this program? 
So um, if you're interested, I'll have to reach out to um, Karen Kotler and figure that out. What we've done in the past for um, like grad entry students, they have clinicals that they have to do. They just kind of front load or back load the clinical um, requirement so that they're able to go while they're in, uh, well, like able to go while the program is running and then the other parts of the summer, they complete the hours that they have to do. So if that um, if that's something that you're interested in, the sooner you let me know, um, I can reach out to Dr. Kotler and we can work out an arrangement to make sure you're able to attend. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. I will for sure reach out to you because this is for sure something I'm very much um, interested in. Perfect. I just put my email in the chat for um, anybody that has questions about that. How many students are you accepting for each Spain and Rwanda program? Is there a limitation to how much you accept from the UIC college? There's no limitation. Um, we will certainly assess the situation if we got a ridiculously high amount of students applying to the program, but um, there's there's no plans for anything like that. Yeah, the I believe the minimum on the program is usually either 10 to 12 students, so there has to be at least that many to make the, the budget work. Um, and then it's usually the number is about 10 to 16. If it's more than 16, then we start to look at like, well, do we need a TA or another faculty to kind of support and make sure that the students, um, the class sizes aren't too big and too overwhelming. But um, I've taken as many as, oh, 24, uh, not at UIC, but before um, with two faculty. So one time when I was a graduate assistant, there was two faculty and me and there were 36 students and that was a lot. So, um, but <laughs> yeah, it, 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 there is rolling admission. So once the applications become available, we do admit as the applications come in. So um, if you wanna make sure to have your spot, the earlier you apply, the um, more likely it is that you'll be able to go. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, I'm going to transition. I'm going to talk about the last program, um, which is in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, and then we should have some time uh, at the end again. So if you still have questions, um, then uh, you can ask them after that. So let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me go back to the beginning. All right, can you all see? <clears throat> can you all see my screen? Okay, great. So um, this is the last program I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is disaster preparedness and global health in the Caribbean. Um, it, this is like kind of a little test. So if you look at the picture, there are two disasters happening simultaneously in that picture. Can anybody name them? I'm not sure if you put them in the chat, I won't be able to see it. So if anybody can like look at the chat. <laughs> no, y'all don't wanna play, okay maybe sorry drought maybe i'm looking at the yep. grass good job yep drought so like this is a tropical island and it's very brown so this was last year and they were having a huge drought um and so the second disaster is kind of related to the drought conditions um do y'all notice the different colors of the clouds like some are like a white gray and the others have a little bit more of like a brownish tint to them so there's actually a wildfire that a brush fire that broke out um, that they were responding to in some of the old sugarcane fields that they have on the island. So, um, yeah, we were up on a hill and I saw this and I was like, oh, this is a great picture to illustrate that nobody's immune from disasters. And you think about a small island in the Caribbean. Normally you think about, well, hurricanes, obviously. But here we have both drought and wildfires. So they will end at the the islands both have volcanoes, so they're um, they're susceptible to a lot of different types of disasters, which is why we um, go here to study disasters because they really do have to kind of prepare for everything. Um, 
So the first question I get is, well, where is St. Kitts and Nevis? So um, if you see at the top, you can see Florida. Um, it's the green color. If you go southeast of Florida, you'll see it circled down here, St. Kitts and Nevis. It's a small two island nation. It's about 90 miles from St. Martin. Um, and there's a spot on the island you can look out and you can see a lot of the surrounding islands too. Um, this is a map of St. Kitts. It kind of looks like a banjo. Um, we're going to be staying in Frigate Bay, which is the uh, circled area. Basseterre is the capital. It's uh, about a 10 minute taxi drive um, and it takes about mm, two hours maybe to drive around the entire island. Um, so it's not very big. Um, Nevis is even smaller. Um, I believe that square miles Nevis is as large as O'Hare International Airport, um, but it does feel a lot bigger because it's a um, it's a mountain like there's a giant volcano in the middle of it. And so like to get to anywhere, you have to drive around the whole island. So also kind of like the airport, right? Because you can't drive through the airport. So actually didn't realize how similar that was. Um, the objective of this course is about disaster preparedness. So the um, six objectives that we have focus on understanding the local culture um, around healthcare in St. Kitts and Nevis. It does have a pretty strong public health personal preparedness focus. Um, and so we use those principles and apply them um, to the environment in St. Kitts and Nevis. So we learn a lot from um, local government officials about their culture, about their infrastructure and how they are and sometimes are not prepared for different types of disasters. Um, we also participate in some sort of community engaged project every year to improve the resilience to the disasters. So for example, a couple of years ago, we interviewed um, managers and leaders within the hospitals, the clinics and the community shelters about what their disaster plans were. Um, and they all had them, but none of them had actually been written down. So we formalized their disaster plans and then communicated that to the National Disaster Agency and um, back to the um, organization. Last year, we did some community surveys um, post COVID. One of them was asking about psychosocial needs during the COVID-19 pandemic and immediately um, and now and seeing if things had improved, what types of services people had used um, so that they can use that to prepare better for the next pandemic or other type of you know, similar disaster. Um, and then the other one was looking at the concept of food security. Um, as an island, they're very de um, dependent on imported foods and goods. Um, and so when they had that massive supply chain issue and a lot of supply chain issues during COVID, there was trouble getting food on the island. Um, although they do have very fertile grounds, a lot of people don't farm. Um, and so we were asking about kind of their attitudes and barriers to farming um, and then sharing that back to the government um, so that they can use that to inform their um, programs and policies to try to support that. Um, and all of our all of our projects come from the National Disaster Management Agency. Um, we work directly with them, um, and I I worked with them for over a decade there. Um, and so they uh, they help inform what we're doing. So what you what you do there really does make a difference, and really does matter to the people. Um, we also look a little bit at. The differences between the U.S. healthcare system as well as St. Kitts and Nevis, um, theirs is based on the British model. Um, they do have national health care, but they have a much stronger focus on public health and prevention and a much, much uh, weaker focus on acute care services. And so you can kind of see how that reality is played out for their populations and both the strengths and the weaknesses of that model. Um, and then we also look at concepts around health equity, so social justice and human rights using a global perspective um, around the community. So for the course faculty, there's actually three of us. So as Dr. Kilroy mentioned, I will be teaching the, uh, the course in Spain this year. Um, and so I will be setting up and planning the course in St. Kitts and Nevis, but then um, Rohan Jeremiah will actually be teaching it from UIC. Um, he's the uh, interim dean of uh, global health. So he's kind of my boss um, and he uh, has, taught before um, in Grenada in the Caribbean and study abroad there. So he's um, very familiar with the um, culture. Um, his uh, heritage is from the Caribbean as well. So you'll be in great hands there. And then the third instructor is Audrey Snyder. Um, she is a professor at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Um, she was one of my mentors um, as a nursing student and she and I have been doing this program together 
um, at various institutions um, for the last 10 years. And so she'll be bringing some students from the US, UNC Greensboro to meet up with us at UIC um, and then um, we'll all kind of learn together. So last year we had 14 UIC students and six students from North Carolina, and we all participated and learned together. And it was a really great environment and a way to um, meet people from another university as well. So the cost of attendance estimated um, is around $27,2800. $2, um, we're still finalizing those numbers, um, but that should it should be close to that. Um, this includes three credit of tuitions, your um, in-country transportation um, around the airport and around the island, um, your housing, you'll be in hotels, um, you'll have a roommate, and then it includes uh, some group meals as well. Does not include airfare, which is usually around $800 to $1,000 from Chicago, um, from O'Hare Airport. Any fees that you need to get a passport, um, some meals that you'll have to spend, um, purchase on your own, and then any personal spending money. But all of your activities um, are included. So um, I'll go through some of the, the, fun, the fun stuff that we do. Um, here are some of your accommodations. So on the left is Wally Beach Resort on Nevis. And I don't know if you can see, but there are like two monkeys <laughs> in that um, in that picture. So there's like monkeys and sometimes there's donkeys walking around there. Um, it's a very rural community, but to the left is like literally the most beautiful beach, the most beautiful beach you've ever seen. And you stay in these cute little beach cottages, um, which you can kind of see the porch on the right. Um, so that's in Nevis and we're there for about a week. And then on the right is Sugar Bay Resort, which is in St. Kitts. It's on the Atlantic side. So that's a beach um, that has a really dangerous current. So uh, none of the locals swim there. We don't swim there. It's not safe. But you, but the island is so thin at the point where we're staying, you can walk to Frigate Bay where there's on the Caribbean side where you can swim safely. And there's a nice beach there with a lot of restaurants. Um, there's a lot of um, restaurants and there's like a little grocery store right next to um, the resort there. And then they have two pools um, as well. And they also have kind of like little cottages as well as more of like a traditional hotel. Um, usually we have the students stay in, it's a, um, four bedroom cottage and it has a kitchen and everything in it that you can use as well. So um, some of the highlights um, that we do, cultural historic visits, um, we go on a historic tour of Bastyr. Um, so St. Kitts and Nevis is a former um, slave, well, not a slave colony, but they, uh, the British owned St. Kitts and Nevis and imported slaves to basically, um, run sugar plantations and export back to Great Britain. Um, they've been independent since about the 1980s. They're actually the smallest um, country in the Western hemisphere. Um, and they no longer do sugar plantation, uh, sugar like agriculture. They do um, tourism as their primary um, industry. And so obviously with COVID, with everything shutting down, it was a really hit, big hit to their economy. So um, you'll learn a little bit about that. Um, the picture that you see is at one of the botanical gardens that we visit um, on Nevis. And in the background is Nevis Peak. So I mentioned that there's a volcano. So you kind of have to drive around it to get anywhere um, in Nevis. Um, we do actually hike that volcano at some point. Um, we also go zip lining and snorkeling on St. Kitts. We do a fun mass casualty scenario on the beach. Um, we do some of our lectures on the beach. Um, we do tour uh, both a hospital in St. Kitts and in Nevis, as well as some of their community clinics. And then every year we do a disaster preparedness project. Um, this year we talked about um, doing like a community day in Nevis to um, raise awareness in the community about disaster preparedness and personal preparedness, and also to try to get um, people to sign up to volunteer as part of the um, like community disaster team in Nevis. So here is some pictures on the left is um, <clears throat> uh, Brimstone Hill, which is a historic uh, British fort that was constructed during the French and British War, um, which they fought over the island. Um, Basseterre is initially uh, was the, the French capital and it's French, I think, for like low lying because um, it's very close to sea level. So um, there you'll see both kind of the French colonial and British colonial influences um, in the islands, um, as well as the Native American um, Carib Indians who were there before the colonists. Um, there are some um, petroglyphs, as you can see here. This is um, one that they've painted over so you can see it better, but it's a um, 
uh, the mountain on St. Kitts is called La Amiga, which means fertile land. Um, and so this is like a symbol of the fertile land or the fertility. So it's like a pregnant woman. Um, there's also a, on the bottom right is um, one of the old Anglican churches. I think it's one of the oldest churches on the island. It's in Basseter, um as well. And then um, the top right is the salmon tree. It's over 200 years old. It's very large. It's um, in uh, Carib it's in Romney Manor, which is an old plantation that's turned into a botanical garden. Um, and they also do fabric batiking, um, which is like using wax and dye to create these beautiful fabrics in, an, um, in like a traditional African um, style, which is really cool. Um, we go zip lining as well. Here's some pictures of some of the students. Um, it's always a lot of fun. Um, and we talk a lot about, um, we build in kind of personal preparedness and risk mitigation and those concepts with zip lining and how we keep ourselves safe because all those concepts apply to disaster management as well. We go snorkeling, again, talking about water safety um, and that type of thing and just exploring and enjoying the environment. Um, where we go, there's actually a shipwreck that you can go snorkeling around and explore and there's lots of fish and a, a reef as well. Um, and they provide us a really great lunch as well. It's a fun, a fun day trip. Um, we have lots of time on the beach. Um, there's like random cats everywhere. Um, so you can see in the top, in the middle, in the top, there's like um, two of our students hanging out at the beach and like our little friendly cat for the day. Um, but they, it's just a gorgeous environment, both in St. Kitts and Nevis. There's a lot of great um, places to relax and enjoy nature during your free time. Um, this is the tour that we took of JNF Hospital, which is on um, St. Kitts, is the main hospital. The top right, you can see the pediatric floor, our pediatric unit. Um, there is a veterinary school. So Rosh University um, has a veterinary school in St. Kitts, and some of their students volunteered and painted this beautiful mural there. Um, and last year, we did visit the vet school and go on a tour, um, and we talked a little bit about um, one Health, which is kind of the concept of human health, animal health, and environmental health are all linked together. And so you have to take care of all three of them in order to ensure the health and longevity of every, everybody and our planet. Um, we hike a volcano. Um, if you look in the bottom middle, um, that's like students going straight up um, a very muddy hill with like roots and ropes to climb. Um, it is very strenuous and it is a lot of fun. Um, pretty much everybody hates me for making them do it for the first, like the next day or so. But then uh, I always get feedback of just, thank you for making me do that. I learned so much about myself and um, it really has uh, a lot to do with um, understanding how nature can sometimes be um, unpleasant and especially in disasters and those types of things but it's a lot of fun we go hiking with um the national disaster coordinator they like literally are in charge of search and rescue so like they're experts they keep us all safe I've never had anybody get hurt or not make it up or down so um it's a lot of fun and you get really muddy and then we uh eat pizza and hang out the rest of the day um, and as I mentioned, we work with disaster management on a project. Um, the top left, you can see us all in front of um, their, their building. Um, and then some of the other pictures are on the far right is one of last year's nursing students doing a survey about food security at the farmer's market. In the middle um, is Audrey, one of the course faculty talking with one of the farmers um, about uh, agriculture. And then in the bottom left is me and um, Abdia Samuel, who is the national disaster coordinator. So he's like the equivalent of head of FEMA and, and we went on, went on a hike. So um, we have a lot of access to very high ranking government officials um, to talk about both like kind of the national, local and international aspects of disaster management, um, which is a really kind of unique combination, which is really cool. So um, are there any questions? for me or about any of the programs. Um, what are the program dates for the Rwanda and the Caribbean programs? Um, so St. Kitts and Nevis, I believe, I should put that on there. It's May 20th through June 3rd is the travel dates. And then um, a week before we do like a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, where we do some lectures. And then um, Pam, I believe you can go ahead and talk about your program. 
Oh, sure. It's the month of July. So um, you, you'd leave the US on July the 1st and arrive in Rwanda July the 2nd. Normally it's, it's eight hours from Chicago to Europe and maybe Brussels or Amsterdam or somewhere. And then it's eight hours from, um, from Europe down to um, Rwanda. And so that's for July. And then the last day is the 31st of um, July. So you'll be in country for 30 days. Um, are these days the same every year for both all the programs, I guess? Yes, roughly. I mean, plus or minus a day based on the calendar. So it's like a Saturday. It's like usually for my program, it's like we travel the third Saturday in May and then we're back like the first Sunday in June. When do applications open for these programs? As soon as possible. We're looking to open them up very soon. We're just finalizing some details, but um, the general application cycle will be, uh, you know, as soon as we can get them open in the next couple of weeks through uh, the application deadline in the middle of next semester in mid-March. Will we get another email about them or should we just it, keep them on the site? Um, I'll send an email out uh, to the student listserv once they're open for everybody. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and about the FNP question, I did have an FNP student participate on my program in 2019. She was an FNP DNP student, um, and she was able to do fine with her classes and everything. Do the credits work the same if you're a DNP, FNP for the programs? Is it still six credits, or did it change? Or yeah, it's okay. it's the same. Yeah, my my program's three credits, um, but the okay. other two are six credits, and they just count as an elective. All right, any other questions? Well, great, if you have any more questions, um, you can reach out to me, uh, my email's there, or you can reach out to um, either Dr. Kilroy or Dr. Meharry about the um, their specific programs. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you um, about the program. So actually you can reach out to me for, for Spain, I'm sorry. Um, I can talk to you about Spain or St. Kitts and Dr. Meharry can talk to you about um, Rwanda. And then um, Anthony was in the study abroad team is great with um, questions about applications and um, financial aid. Um, I did want to add that the College of Nursing Global Health Office also has nursing scholarships. And um, last year, every nursing student that participated was able to get um, a scholarship. I believe we covered about 20% of the program fee for all of the programs for all of the nursing students. So um, depending on how much funding and how many students there are depends on how much aid is given. But we do um, we do have money um, that we give to students that um, apply for scholarships with nursing. Um, and so that application will come out probably um, in the spring um, and is available to anybody that applies for any of the nursing faculty led study abroad programs. All right, well, I think uh, that's it. If there are any more questions, like I said, just send us an email. Thank you so much for coming. Um, tell your friends. I'll send out an email um, when this is posted as well as the slides and when the applications are open. So thank you all so much. Have a good weekend. Bye. Take care. Thank you.